And that template is converted into a BNF grammar. Um, we have a fitness function. So we have the components there of a GP system. And what we're going to do is actually create C code and run it um, on, instead of on a PDP 11, on a parallel graphics card. And perhaps we'll have time to talk a little bit about future work, which is a, the Gizmo project, which is just starting. So the idea is, what we want to do is use GP to create small pieces of code. I mean, realistically, these will always be small pieces of code. Um, and cases where we might want to do this are where you want to glue together existing systems. Um, maybe you have a hard problem where maybe two systems are written in, in different languages. Uh, and it's difficult to get somebody who's skilled in, in all of those languages. So you might, might have a case where you wanted to generate something that was compatible with different systems. Um, generally where you can recognize a solution when you have it, but specifying what it is up front is going to be difficult. So the idea is the GP can try lots of things. I mean, you can try literally thousands of things, and most of those can be totally rubbish. Most of them will be totally rubbish, as long as every so often you get something useful. And what we, where we actually see this being used for real is perhaps what the GP does is come up with prototypes which can then suggest ideas to software designers. So I've talked about, yes, we want to um, target a small system. The, the Gizmo approach is actually to use an existing, um, system, an existing implementation as a framework. So the idea is we have this big box is supposed to be the existing system. We're taking from that an existing module which we want to port, maybe we want to port it from um, uh, a PDP 11 to uh, um, uh, maybe a mobile phone or something. But essentially, we highlight a small fraction of the code which we want to automatically translate to a new environment. We run the existing system and instrument it so we know the data flows into that module and the, the data flows out. And that becomes the training data, it becomes a de facto specification for the replacement module. What we're saying is, as long as we re the thing that we put in there um, takes the same inputs and generates the same outputs, it's a satisfactory replacement. Um, so effectively, this, this environment becomes an oracle, becomes a test oracle. As long as your new SAT did exactly what the old one did, uh, it passes the test. And so we, we sidestep the Oracle problem. As I've already mentioned, we're going to use GZIP as our, our demonstration system. Uh, GZIP works by uh, scanning files, looking for um, sequences which are repeated. So it spends a huge amount of time just scat um, passing through files, um, doing byte comparisons. And that's where pretty much all of the compute time goes. And that's the module that we're going to um, ask GP to evolve. And what we're asking GP to, to do is evolve a parallel version of that. What we actually start with is, as I've said, um, a CUDA um, template. So this is a, a, um, a template which has been provided by manufacturers. Um, we convert that by hand into a BNF grammar. And the point here is the grammar severely constrains what the GP can do. It will generate code that is legal, it will compile, it will run, and it will terminate. So a lot of the problems with just generating code at random are tackled by using this grammar. Once we've got code, so. So your grammar doesn't want the syntax in the semantics? Uh, 
the grammar, this partly is tied up with um, the way that the CUDA kernels work. So essentially, um, the case, case of interest is where, where you have loops and the grammar is constrained so that those loops will terminate. Okay. Um, I think this timeout essentially, if anything goes around far too long, it imports. So it's pragmatic. Um, and so when we come to the fitness testing, we, we test the new GP is generated code um, with the data we gathered on the original version of GZIP. So, um, the point is, NVIDIA has supplied a large number of, of working examples. Um, they've been generated by experts in CUDA. They're certainly there. They're more skilled at writing CUDA than I am. Um, and what I've done is I've just taken one of those which seem to be this close a match to what we wanted GZIP to do. Um, but the template that we supply to GP knows nothing about and about GZIP itself. The, what it does is it constrains it to generate things which will be um, CUDA kernels uh, and then the search is guided by the fitness function. And so, yeah, that's a bit about the cost of doing this. Um, so we, we're going to... GCP is taken from the SIR repository, which includes a test suite. So the, we have a, a, a series of tests we can run on GZIP, um, gives something like a million and a half test records. That spills it down to about 30,000, mostly by eliminating duplicates. And of those 30,000, uh, we randomly choose 100 each generation for the GP. So we're not, we're not running our test kernel <coughs> On the, on the whole problem, we're running them on a subset. So the fitness is based on a subset of, of all of the SIR um, test cases. But as we'll see, we actually evolved something that can pass them all. Uh, the way the GP works is it has a population of a thousand. Um, for pragmatic reasons, that's bro broken down into ten groups of 100 kernels each, and those are compiled together. Um, but, so the point is that we compile, instead of compiling an individual at one at a time, we actually compile 100 individuals in one go. <coughs> Even so, the compilation time is about seven times as long as the run time. So by run time, I mean the, the time to actually pass the compiled code through the test cases. Um, and the way we do the test cases is we load one test onto the machine, onto the graphics machine, the 295 GTX, and we then run our whole population on that. We record the answers they produced, and then we go on to the next one. So we actually loop around there a hundred times. Each time we compare the answer the evolved individuals produced with what they should have produced according to GZIP. And the performance measure is simply the sum of the absent error plus some penalty terms. And the penalty terms are <laughs> essentially so that kernels that just return zero all the time uh, don't get lots of children. Um, so, the, so this line red line is the, the evolution of performance. So what we got up here on the log scale is the best individual on the population in terms of their error. So error zero means they actually scored exactly right on all 100 cases. And you see it starts off pretty poor. And then by that generation 50 or so, we get um, a perfect individual. And that individual remains, or at least, descendants of that individual remain in the population from there on. The point of this one is, is to give you some idea of the size of the individuals. So this is uh, a path 
through the BNF grammar, the, diff the ovals are, are branch points. So uh, a red oval means we went left at that point, a white one means we went right. Um, and some of the uh, rules are given names. So you can give some idea of the complexity of the evolved solution in terms of grammar. And this is the actual code. Um, it doesn't really stand out very well, but the, the top line is in blue. So that's given by the template. So the template forces us to produce something that's going to be a QD kernel, and it's going to terminate with a return statement. So those are given three, and everything in between those is evolved. The stuff in red is the stuff that actually does the work. The stuff in gray is pretty much ignored. So that, that's been automatically generated by GP in response to the fitness function that says do the same thing as GZIP does. Uh, it's been through literally millions of tests and it always returns the same answer as, as GZIP. And by inspection you can see that it is actually the same. Um, but in terms of, of um, will users accept this, there's no formal proof that it does the same as GZIP. Um, from a pragmatic, pragmatic point of view, we can look at the code, at least on this small example, we can look at the code. Um, and as I said, we've tested it literally millions of times. But there's still potentially this problem that somebody might turn around and say, well, how did you know it? How can you prove that this code is, is uh, functionally correct? And the answer is we don't. From a pragmatic point of view, it passes the tests. Um, <coughs> and, <coughs> and to conclude, um, this is the first time that uh, a CUIA kernel has been automatically generated by an AI technique. Surely the answer to the question why this is a form of proof. You say, well, it's the same level of the human being. Okay. Oh, sure. Yeah, and then my, from my point of view as a programmer, I look at that code and I can see that it works. I, I've run tests on it. I am I'm quite happy that it's working. But it, that, um, you should ask them why they okay. I guess, I mean, one answer as well might be the, if you can formally um, categorize the completeness of the test set. Does it cover the space of... Well, why should a, a GA-generated program have to pass greater hurdles? Well, I'm not saying it should, no. Yeah, I'm, that's entirely what I would agree with. But I'm, I raise that as a question because the, this, this problem of producing code, um, particularly producing code rather than producing solutions, um, often attracts the, well, how do you know it's, how do you know it's correct? Um, and most of the time we don't have an answer to that. Robert? Yes. Uh, 